You're listening to the Veterinary Innovation Podcast. You're listening to the Veterinary Innovation Podcast. My name is Sean Wilkie, and along with my awesome co-host, we interview the innovators in this space every week. Just before we get started this week, we want to shout out to our friends at the Vet Show at Home group. They are holding a virtual trade show from the 25th to the 27th of March. Great opportunity to get some free CE and head over and check them out. And with that, Ivan, over to you to get us started. Hi, I'm Ivan Zach, and I'm happy to introduce you to Dr. Lisa Amelar. Did I butcher that? No, it's perfect. <laughs> Thank you. We're going to talk about in-home veterinary care. On the business side, Lisa is an owner and a head veterinarian of House Paws Mobile Veterinary Services. Uh, she's a DVM from Virginia Maryland College of Veterinary Medicine and holds a bachelor degree in biology chemistry from Sweet Briar College. On the personal side of things, uh, she read the stories of James Herod in high school and loved the idea of being a traveling vet. She's living the dream now. She advocates for buying local and supporting other small businesses. Lisa, welcome to the podcast and thank you for finding the time. Yeah, thank you for having me. So I have a bunch of questions. First of all, I tried mobile uh, veterinary services to establish that. I've done that in uh, British Columbia uh, on uh, uh, Vancouver Island. And I did that for about two months and I ended up driving around with a lot of euthanized dogs. Uh, that was the main service that people were requesting. It was basically convenient to euthanize at home. And uh, I kind of didn't want to do that anymore. It was The fun part was that it was a kind of a posh area, and then you could charge clients anything. And that is very important for veterinary services that are mobile because you can do less appointments. So... Can you tell us what inspired you to start this? Uh, how do you find appointment management and what is good about it? Because you scaled it. I'm super interested. It actually started as kind of an accident. I, I did have, um, I did read James Harriet. One of, uh, a member, a gentleman gave me a James Harriet book when I was working as a clerk in a video store and that piqued my interest. He knew I wanted to be a vet when I got older and I thought it was just really like, kind of a romantic way of working, you know, as a high school student, I just thought it was neat. And then um, I loved PMM. They called it PMM at Virginia Tech, which is when you went out on the truck with the large animal vets to like do the farm work. And I thought that was really cool. I thought that was super fun to go out and just be out all day and see different um, landscapes and different farms. And I thought that was neat. And then I ended up having two home births. So I had care for myself at home, three of my kids, two of them were at home. So I kind of was like, wow, you can do a lot at home, <laughs> you know, because uh, they had all kinds of equipment that they brought to the house and, and everything, which was really neat. So um, I kind of got disenchanted with traditional medicine in a hospital. I was coming in in the morning. It was dark. I was leaving at night. It was dark. Despite being a popular vet and having great client relations, the clients would complain at the front desk about the, um, you know, the cost of, of being there. So when, when it came to a job change, I was like, you know, um, I think I'm going to try being, being mobile. And I was lucky cause I, um, had 10 years of, of a following so 10 years of being a vet in the area. And I just made like a quick job change and, and put out there, Hey, I'm, I'm going mobile. And I remember my accountant saying like, you're too good to be mobile. It's a horrible horrible career change. Like you're never going to make enough money. You're never going to see enough people. And that made me, I'm kind of that person that then wants to do it even more, like even more. I'm like, okay, game on. <laughs> so it, it, um, it was definitely like the first year just trying to figure things out. Um, I never said no the first year. And the first year I feel like I spent a lot of time telling people that mobile's for everybody. Cause I think in the beginning it was like, oh, you do euthanasias and people that can't like old people or disabled people. Like you only see those people. And I'm like, no, no, everybody should have mobile. Like it should be like the young professional. It should be the people with families and you want your kids to be part of it. Like it should be everybody with a pet that wants their pet to be comfortable. So I feel like in the beginning, it was just a lot of like marketing the idea of mobile. Cause there weren't really, there was like one or two mobile vets in the area who were very old school mobile vet, like vaccines. They were by themselves you know, and they referred everything that was complicated, you know, like short of blood work and vaccines and euthanasias, they were referring their services to like 
land facilities. And my goal was like to be high quality, let's do everything that we can short of procedure, like, you know, surgeries in a house and not lose our clients when it comes time to have a procedure. Because I feel like that's where a lot of mobile vets lose their clients is when the going gets tough, they have to refer and people want to be with you. Like they've been with you the whole time. They trust you and they want to stay with you when problems arise. That's awesome. So, so much resonated with me there. I also loved on the rotation in the fourth year. I did only one large animal and traveling from farm to farm, seeing different families and how they grow, you know, that was, that was the best. And I, I was in school on PEI. This is sort of Atlantic Canada. And it was a beautiful fall rotation. We were going in the truck, seeing, you know, all these uh, farms. And it, it was amazing. I loved it. But uh, but I was terrible at large animal. One time I was palpating the cow and then it, it was kind of getting cold. And then the professor was like, okay, so what are you feeling now? And I'm just standing there with my hand in the cow's butt. And I'm like, it's warm. That's not <laughs> like it's warm. So anyway, that tells you how good of a large animal vet I am. It says a lot more. It says a lot more about you as well. But let's let's not go, <laughs> go ahead and ask ask the next question. <laughs> so well, hopefully nobody's listening. So then the clinic. So it is super important to then when you do go over that threshold, what you can do at home, that you have a clinic. So how do you manage that as a mobile vet? So do you have a permanent clinic and establishment, or do you utilize others? How does that work? So each we have right now we have four territories, three of which we have land clinics. Um, every territory we started with just a mobile, and we would rent a local clinic. So in the beginning, we would you know rent a local clinic, have clinic hours, and then just be mobile. And then as as our clientele grew, and we were starting to pay the clinic owners more money than rent, we would just then we would open up our own place. Um, so each one kind of grew that way. And our fourth one right now is mobile only and we rent a clinic. So it kind of helps us make sure that we have the ability to um, pay the rent, so to speak. You know, I, I think one, there's a lot of clinics that have space, like they're not doing surgery every day. They're not making money. They have empty hospital space. So I think it's beneficial to the local practitioner. And I think that, you know, we, we set up rules with them like, uh, you know, we're, we're not going to park our van labeled in their parking lot. We're not going to like steal their clients. If, if if we see their clients in an emergency, we refer them back. We're really, really good about making sure that we are staying, you know, staying, staying friendly with the local vets. So they've always been happy because we make them a lot of money. It's really interesting, Lisa. And I'd like to kind of go back to, you know, the start, you know, you had this kind of idea that mobile was for everybody and dive a little bit into what you learned and, you know, what made you make that change and what the business looks like today compared to what it looked like when you started? Honestly, very quickly, I learned that home care is truly um, holistic, you know, and holistic, not in the term of homeopathic or whatever, like holistic in the term of like seeing the animal as a whole, you know, we get to see how they walk, we get to see how they move, they don't stop coughing, they don't stop limping, that we're not in a small exam room that's constraining their space, we get to see how the humans interact with the pet at home, you know, so if they have the grumpy dad who's like miserable, and yelling at the cat as it walks by and the cat's there peeing around the house, then we know there's some like human issues in the house <laughs> that are, you know, that we need to talk about. Like sometimes it's not always the pet's behavior. Um, we can smell the house. We can see the box. We can see the feeding arrangements. So very quickly, I learned that my way of taking history was all wrong because, right, we, we take histories a certain way. We ask certain questions, but there's questions that you don't even think about asking when you can't see the environment. Uh, and for instance, I remember one household, you know, I was there and the cat's vomiting, you know, and I'm asking, what does she feed? How often does she feed? You know, the questions you would normally ask. And then I asked if she could show me where she feeds the pet. Well, despite what she told me, she had 10 bowls of food out with 10 different foods all. And they were, they didn't even look fresh. Like half of them were wet. They didn't look fresh. Like, it was kind of gross. <laughs> so the, the the cat had like a feeding trough. It would look like the like the buffet, you know. And um, my line of history taking never said like well, how many bowls or how many different types of fancy feast do you lay out at a time. Yeah, true. He never asked that. <laughs> no, no. And I I feel like um, asthmatic cats like sometimes we're there seeing one cat for one thing and the other cat's having an asthma attack and the whole house smells like plug in like incense stuff and smoking and the, the you know, um, I just feel like you get so many clues that you would never think of asking when you're in the house. And I feel like we catch orthopedic issues very early because 
we're used to seeing animals move, but a lot of, a lot of humans aren't used to seeing their animals move. So like in the home environment, they're bouncing around or running around the house. You see that there's carpets or no carpets or, you know, areas that the dogs like taking corners. And I think you get to see their gait and you get to like point out things at a much earlier place than waiting until they're actually like coming in and, and lame and, and something's happened. Treats, the wrong treats around the house, like the things that break teeth. We see all that stuff, you know, so I, I feel like it's very common that people are showing us their cupboards and they're showing us their litter boxes, catching constipation or bowel issues early. All that stuff that maybe the owners don't even talk about is just like right there for you to see at home. So I think it's just gives you a better, a better perspective to help the patient. That's really cool. I never thought about it that, that you get a much better history and probably much better observations. And that that's super interesting. I do want to ask all kinds of smart questions, but I want to ask this first. What's the weirdest situation you ran into when you went to see a client? Uh, the weirdest situation. We did have a client that um, I was there to see his uh, his dog, but he wanted to know if I would see his, she, what are those spiders called? Oh, Jesus. Tarantula? <laughs> yeah, tarantulas. He had a room, like a big room, like a man cave, and his tarantulas just walked around. And he wanted to know if I would vet his tarantulas. And I'm like, I don't even know what to do with the tarantula. And I definitely don't want to go into that part of the house. I never went in. I don't want to go in. <laughs> so that was interesting. I, I definitely think uh, beyond that, um, just euthanasia, the way that people um, celebrate end of life, I've seen some very different like ways of celebrating the end of life. And I never realized the, the disservice we do pets to euthanize in the hospital until I started doing home house calls. And it's not what I do most of the time. Like there's plenty of days where I don't do any euthanasias, but I definitely think um, probably the oddest one, and I don't want to make anybody uncomfortable by talking about their, their religion or, but we, we did have one um, lady, I think she was Wiccan and they had a big ceremony and then they kept the pet on ice so that they could save the hide the next day. Like, like the lead, the leader of the church was going to come over and help remove the hide and they make drums and stuff. Like they, they make things to, re, you know, so I'd never have had that before. And when the pet was dying, they banged a drum and it was slow. And then as the pet, as I gave more euthanasia solution, it got faster. And then the last bang was banging the pet out the, the window. Like it was like, boom, 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 boom. And then like a send off out the open window. So that was an interesting ceremony. If you ever get one of those again, can you call Ivan? Cause I think we, should go, <laughs> we could do a specific episode just on that. Yeah. She did invite me to come and help with the hide removal. And I was like, I'm okay. I don't really like touching dead animals like after they're cold. So I was like, I'll leave you guys to that. And uh, I thought it was great. Jimmy, she had lots of feather things and deer hides and things she had made. And I think it's a great way to honor the pet, but um, it was definitely the first time I have had that. I did have a Mastiff owner ask for his pet's ears and we told him that we could not do that. We could not remove the pet's ears. Wow. That reminds me about uh, I had the the guy come in and he brought in two turtles mm -hmm. when I was in emergency hospital and it was the guy he was a foreigner, uh, I mean a newcomer I should say uh, and uh, and then he brought in two turtles and then they were turtles that that are local habitat you can't have local habitat at home but he didn't know that because he was a newcomer and then one turtle had no legs and another one had only one leg. And I said, what happened? And basically he thought that for environmental enrichment, he'll put them outside in a little pen and they would just, you know, be there. And I think that the raccoon came overnight and ate four legs on one turtle and three on the other one. And he oh. asked me, can, can you fix that? And I was like, we are out of fresh prosthetics for turtles today. So <laughs> no. <laughs> and then I had, and then I had to euthanize a turtle, which I don't know if you ever had experience with that, but that also is a pretty difficult task. Like they don't just, you can't just hit them in the heart. And then, so anyway, there's all these vet stories, but I want to go back to the other questions. Those are amazing. Thank you. So now uh, COVID super interested. How did that change the environment? Was there a boost in more clients? Uh, was there, was there a drop? How, how did it change the mobile vet world? Honestly, it, it hasn't changed our world a whole lot. Uh, definitely more clients, definitely more clients want to be seen. Uh, a lot of hospitals. So we have, we have 16 veterinarians. 
our it was really wow. kind of a, a strike of luck. We had a because we're mobile, we do a lot of um, online Zoom meetings and things like that. And we had a big meeting that was in person or Zoom prior to COVID. And the topic was hot topics in veterinary medicine. And one of the topics turned in was COVID and it was before COVID. Like it was when COVID was not here. And um, our staff all talked about it at that time. And then it ended up that um, when we had to make a decision, everybody was kind of already had thought about it and all the vets didn't want to change what we were doing. Um, so we modified, we modified things a little bit. We did, did more patients outside if the owners wanted. We obviously make sure we use our own surfaces, which we were already doing. So we come into your house, maybe we set up in the foyer or the backyard or the porch, but we're already using our own tables and stuff. We wash our hands when we enter, we wash our hands when we leave, we have hand sanitizer in the truck. We already had all that stuff. You know, cats we see in the bathroom, but again, we use our own surfaces. So even if it's a small bathroom, our table fits in like the shower stall if we wanted to, you know, so, you know, it's pretty compact. So honestly, I feel safer in someone's house than I do in a hospital or in Wawa or the grocery store. You know, like I feel like people are pretty sure. Yeah. And even if the house is messy, I still feel like we're using our own space. So short of putting the laptop down, like my stuff isn't touching anybody else's stuff. And clients are very, you know, I, I was just on a, a call with a bunch of other veterinarians and they were saying how clients are lying to get served. And I feel like because we are open to serving them, clients are very honest with us. You know, they'll call and say they have a fever. They'll cancel their appointment. They'll reschedule. They'll, they'll say we were exposed to someone. I feel like because the doors are open and they know that we're not restricting their access to us, that they're actually more honest with us and, um, and we do serve people with COVID. We do serve people exposed to COVID, um, but we modify what we do. You know, we wear, you know, PPE, like we have gowns and face masks. We look like, you know, Dexter when we get dressed up to go, you know, and to, you know, but we'll, we'll, you know, have them put the leash through the door, grab the leash, walk into the backyard with the pet, call the owner on the phone and they can look through the window as we wow. work with the pet. Anything we use, we keep separate. We hose it, not hose it down, but spray it down with, you know, cleaner and, I don't know where we just have like a good protocol for it. And, um, you know, before we go into senior homes, we get temperature checked. We temperature check ourselves. We've been really lucky. We have over a hundred client uh, staff members and we've only had one COVID positive and it was not related to work. Um, it was wow. related to, awesome. effort to going to a family event. Someone at the family event had COVID and luckily they were off and never came into our hospital. Um, so I feel like, I feel like our team was ready to discuss protocols because we'd already discussed it and everybody follows the protocols. And, you know, I guess the only downside is, is we, we, we did change. We pod people. So we have the mm -hmm. same groups working together. Um, so like if I work, I work with like mainly like two technicians now when I used to work with anybody. So I work with like a team. And then if the team goes down, the team goes down. Like if me and Natalia get sick, me and Natalia are out, you know, yep. for the count. And, and I think that maybe that's a little different than if in a hospital situation, the whole hospital goes down, maybe if everybody's exposed. Yeah, that's great. So, so now tell me about, a little bit about how to scale this. So basically you're, you know, you started this, you liked it. And then how do you invite the second vet or how do you invite the 16 vets and to say, Hey, we're doing this and this is awesome. What is that that is attracting people to work in a mobile environment? Obviously you did a great job of marketing it to them. So what is it that attracts them and how did you end up saying, well, I can do this as a organization and I'm going to build it out. It honestly was completely accidental. Um, I, uh, I, I wanted to be Dr. Lisa's mobile vet service. It was just going to be me. I was going to make sure I went to every kid's soccer game and not work a lot and things, um, spiraled out of control. And I was seeing appointments at two in the morning. Like I really am booked. I won't be able to come out till tomorrow or two in the morning. They're like two in the morning is great. We're up, you know? So like it ended up with me just not being able to say no to people, which I think is a common vet problem. And then, um, the second vet that came on, you know, I didn't have a lot to offer at first. I didn't have like all the benefit packages of a regular hospital. So at the first, it was, uh, I think the first person that reached out to me was a veterinarian that was a friend of mine. She adopted a, a kid and she couldn't work nights and weekends anymore. So she came to me and said, I want flexibility and I don't, I get all my benefits through my partner. So she came on board. And then as we made more money, we added, you know, days off and this and that. And I think the people that get attracted to mobile might be disenchanted with 
traditional veterinary medicine kind of the same way I was. I think there are people that are looking for a deeper connection. They don't just want to have five minutes, seven minutes in an exam room. They want a little bit more than that. I think there are people that really want to work up uh, medical cases. I think a lot of people think mobile's like, like I said, just vaccines, but we honestly see a lot of second opinions. I don't know why, like you would come to me for a second opinion from University of Pennsylvania, right? Usually it's the opposite. Usually you go to University of Pennsylvania from a second opinion from a GP. That's trust. That's trust right there. Yeah. I think what happens is people get very confused. They don't have hand holding that they need and they just want someone to hold their hand and walk them through and understand. So I think a lot of it is just lack of understanding and the need to have someone that has is right there for them. You know, they can't get through on the phones or they don't understand they were told, or maybe it wasn't working and they're not getting the answers they need and they need someone to look at it from a different perspective. Um, and I definitely feel like that's one way that mobile works better is that I think being able to have the full perspective and seeing the whole picture does help you make put the pieces of the puzzle together a little bit better. Yeah. So I, I've got a couple of questions. So I liked Ivan's question about scaling and how it happened, but you know, on your website, it's super impressive. You've got these little, I think they're forward. I'm not sure what the, what the vehicles are that you guys run around in, but they're pretty neat. And I see that you guys do radiology of all of these services. And so from a technology perspective, what you guys have done is very innovative, but can you tell us a little bit about what the setup's like in those vehicles that you bump around in and, and some of the other services that you offer? I mean, it's just such a fascinating kind of area of veterinary medicine for me. So the, the trucks are, they, we kind of have like a base in the trucks, like we have a full pharmacy in the truck. We have a table scale, we have a large scale, it's a pig scale because we see pigs. So it goes up to like 400 pounds and it's mobile. And we have a small scale, and then we have some like basic equipment, like the, the, the centrifuge and blood pressure machine, alpha track, microchip scanner, and maybe some surgical equipment in case we have to do a laceration repair or something like that. And then we add in what, based on what we're seeing, we choose our equipment for the day. So like some days I might have the mobile x-ray, the cold laser, the mobile ultrasound. Like, so some days I don't have any extra equipment in my truck. Some days my truck's like packed with all this extra equipment based on the cases that we're seeing. And then the vets, luckily our, our care coordinators are trained to triage things very good. So they, they make sure that like one vet has the, the x-ray, you know, it's not like if we have five vets leaving from the same location, they all can have the x-ray. So they make sure that they make it so the same column is doing the x-rays or doing the ultrasounds or whatever. Okay. Awesome. So, so what is the big dream? Are we going to see 16 grow to 316 or, or are you, what's the, what's the expansion plan? Honestly, I would love to make mobile. I would love to make mobile, you know, look, everything's becoming specialty or ER, right. And there's some urgent care centers popping up, but the general practices are, I think the new vets coming out are, are taught more and more to refer, 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 you know, a lot of like the more, the common things that yeah. I feel like we used to do all the time. I think yeah. we're being told to refer when you're like, why it's just a seizure. We can fix that. You know, like we don't need to refer it off the bat. So I think mobile closes that gap. I really do. I really think that I would love house paws to become the mobile vet of America and Canada and Aruba, maybe, you know, go worldwide. Definitely. Aruba. All right. I'll work for you in Aruba. I'll get a job there. Yeah. <laughs> I'll drive the truck. I really do think it closes that gap. There's like a gap that's happening. And I think that mobile is um, a serious contender to close that gap. And I, I, I think that the, the clients benefit, the patients benefit. It's definitely not socioeconomic. I find that, I mean, we see people that live in trailer parks. We see seniors. We see football players, um, porn stars, like you name it. We see them monks. <laughs> we see, we see people that want to spend money on their pet. You know, it doesn't matter what type of paycheck that they make. Um, they, they want their, they want the best for their pet and they want to, they want it, um, a certain way. And I feel like, um, I feel like the need is out there and I, I really hope that it expands. I, I think that, um, a fusion sort of practice is a great idea. I think that like, if you had, I mean, why do we all, you know, Right, right now, right. If I go to the urologist and then I need a CAT scan, right, I go somewhere else. But I don't know why you can't have several vets leaving the hospital, but having the hospital base to be there to support all the other needs. The, the mobile feeds the hospital, right? 
So I go out and I see seven cats that probably would have never have come in. And four of those seven cats need dentistries that feeds the hospital. You know, so I, I think that there's a, a big opportunity. I think that just a lot of places just haven't learned how to do it. Dr. Lisa, this was a pleasure. This was so fun. We burned through so much time so quickly. Uh, we like to wrap up the same way every time. So first question that we've got for you is something that you've read, something that inspired you for your kind of journey as an entrepreneur and a vet along the way. I'll say the most recent thing that really has made a huge difference for me is Traction, like the book Traction. Yay. Um, yeah. One of my advisors recommended it to me. And uh, it honestly, like we stuck to it. We we did the plan and it's made a huge difference and right on. solve problems that we have been struggling with for a long time. So we stick to the Traction plan and, and I love that. I honestly, my whole team right now, the PCC staff is reading Gung Ho. Uh, which is like an old classic. Um, but we probably started with Purple Cow. Purple Cow started. Oh, amazing. My yeah. favorite books. <laughs> yes. And I always thought it was funny because when we or originally, when we put clients in the GPS, it yeah. would look like little viruses because as we grew bigger, it'd be like three people and then 20 spots because I would save people. And then it got mm -hmm. to the point where there was just like dots everywhere. So I really think that we're viral and contagious and all the, the actually my password is purple cow so that's amazing that's yeah. i love seth Godin. i have all his books and just just yeah mm -hmm. that's amazing so the second question we we usually ask do you know anybody in our industry that would be a good guest to invite to this podcast yeah you know what there's um there's another veterinarian his name is dan stoby he owns north star vets which is a specialty clinic i think he's an innovator for a few reasons uh, one he started off as a mobile surgery guy. So he was one of the first mobile surgery guys that was traveling hospital to hospital. Now there's a lot of them, but he was the guy in our area that started that. Um, he definitely gave me some mobile insight in the beginning, even though he wasn't in homes, but his hospital is so beautiful. It's more beautiful than any human hospital I've been to. They have like waiting space for clients. So clients can like hang out while their pets are having their procedures the lunchroom is a shared lunchroom. Uh, it's a, it's a, they used to have like just a staff lunchroom, but they like let the clients come in and, and, That's awesome. and, and eat and hang out. And I think he just has a really great perspective in terms of um, changing with what clients need and want. And, um, you know, he's opened his third practice, I think, in maybe like five years. And, you know, I think he has a, a lot of neat perspectives that would be good to share. Thank you so much for listening to the veterinary innovation podcast if you want to hear about our new episodes please follow us on any social media channel also you can check out our website at veterinaryinnovationpodcast.com see you next week